Okay, good afternoon. My name is Clayton Turner. I'm the Deputy Director here at NASA Langley Research Center, and it is my honor to welcome everyone to today's special event, the official naming ceremony for the future Katherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility. At this time, please silence your cell phones as we honor our nation with the posting of our country's colors by the U.S. Joint Base langley Houston Color Guard and the singing of our national anthem by NASA Langley researcher Carrie Goff. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the And you take your seats, please. Although she needs uh, very little introduction, first and foremost, please join me in welcoming back to NASA Langley Research Center today's special guest of honor, NASA Langley retiree, human computer, Katherine G. Johnson. Also joining her today are her husband, James, and daughters, Jolette Hylek and Catherine Moore. We also have some very special guests here today, and it's my honor to introduce them. The Honorable Bobby Scott, Congressman from the 3rd District of Virginia. <laughs> Representing Congressman Scott Rigel from the 2nd District of Virginia is District Direct Director Shannon Kendrick. 
The Honorable Marcia Price, Delegate to the Virginia General Assembly's 95th District. The Honorable George Wallace, Mayor of the City of Hampton. City of Hampton Councilman Donnie Tuck. Valerie Price, the First Lady of Newport News. And our keynote speaker, Margaret, Margaret Lee Shetterly, author of the book Hidden Figures, the story of African American women who helped win the space race. I would also like to recognize several other guests in our attendance in our audience today. Deputy Chief Counsel John Herzig and NASA General Counsel Samara Thompson King. Thank you. So there's something you should know about why we're, we picked today to hold our event. 55 years ago on May 5th, 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American to ever fly in space. His Mercury capsule, called Freedom 7, carried him up, up about 116 miles and for 15 minutes. He landed safely 310 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center in the Atlantic Ocean. Millions of people around the world watched Shepard's flight, but what they don't know, what they didn't know at the time, was that the calculations that got him into space and safely home were done by today's guest of honor, Katherine Johnson. And I'll just say, I, I, I can't imagine what Catherine must have felt like during that 15-minute ride. <laughs> so I know that was pretty interesting. I also want to point out another interesting fact about today's event, which is being held here in the Reed Conference Center. Dr. Henry J.E. Reed was a, was a center director when Catherine was hired in 1953. He led Langley from 1926 to 1960, from the biplane era to the dawn of the space age. Just down the hall from us is the Pearl Young Theater, named for the first woman hired to do research here at NASA in 1922. All told, there are hundreds of buildings and facilities here at Langley, yet only four of them are named after former employees. Catherine, today you join that elite group with the official naming of the Catherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility. The Computational Research Facility will be a 40,000 square foot consolidated data center that will allow our engineers and scientists to perform advanced computational research and development, crunching data and numbers that will one day help NASA land humans on Mars, design quieter, faster, and more efficient future aircraft, and help us better understand our changing climate. It's not unlike the work that Catherine did in her tenure at Langley, helping NASA send the first Americans into space, into orbit around Earth, and to the moon and back, except she didn't have a 40,000 square foot building full of cutting edge technology. <laughs> she did most of her calculations by hand or in her head, and with the help of the technology of her day, a mechanical calculator type machine called a Monroe Frieden machine. Perhaps just as amazing is that Catherine's work began as NASA's Excuse me, perhaps just as amazing is that Catherine began her work at NASA when women and minorities were marginalized in American society. When she started work in 1953, our center was still segregated. When she, but, as her, but it was her skills, spirit, curiosity, and determination that helped not only solve the difficult challenges of space travel, but also helped break the racial and gender barriers that her and her colleagues faced. Now it is my honor to introduce our first guest speaker, Acting Director of our Office of Equal Opportunity, Mel Faraby. Now it was Mel who initially proposed the idea of naming the CRF after Catherine, and then he worked to, to get approval with senior NASA officials, so please help me in joining and welcoming Mel to the stage. Thank you, Clayton, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I first heard of Dr. Johnson's story 41 years ago here as a high school student. And uh, many of us assembled here already know 
uh, Dr. Johnson's story, but it's worth highlighting one more time. From an early age, Catherine took advantage of the opportunities that came her way. Her passion for numbers and mathematics led her to share her knowledge first as a teacher and then to pursue a career at the Langley Memorial Research Lab, which became NASA Langley Research Center. During a time when women and minorities were marginalized in American society, she persevered. She excelled in what she did. Her reputation for excellence led to assignments that were crucial to America's early space program. She calculated the launch window and trajectory of the first American in space, Alan Shepard, who made that historic flight 55 years ago. And also, today is the very first National Astronauts Day. Her reputation for accuracy was so well known that astronaut John Glenn, whose orbital trajectory was the first to be calculated by electronic computer, asked that Dr. Johnson check those calculations. <laughs> in fact, she helped the agency establish confidence in this newfangled electronic computing. Dr. Johnson was assigned to work on the Apollo's 11 mission, the first mission which humans landed and walked on the moon. And when our nation identified the need for a reusable space vehicle, the space shuttle, large enough to carry the building blocks of what has now become the world's only in-space laboratory, the International Space Station, she calculated those orbital trajectories also. Throughout her career and during her retirement, she took time to encourage young pe people, especially girls, to pursue their dreams in science, technology, engineering, and math. Dr. Johnson, thank you for setting an example from which we can all learn to follow your passion, excel in your work, and encourage others to do the same. You are an inspiration to me and to all of us, not only here at Langley, but across NASA and the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. So at this time, we'd like to show a short video uh, summarizing or highlighting uh, Catherine's career. NASA Langley has been a 
proud to call Camp Hampton home for almost 100 years, and we are grateful for the support of the city and its leaders have shown us. At this time, I'd like to welcome Mayor George Wallace for some opening remarks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is altogether fitting and proper that we are here today to honor a great lady with a no another symbol of her long and distinguished career. We know that she was a child prodigy with a pro prolific capacity to count everything from the numbers of steps from her steps to the church, to the number of dishes on the, sh on the shelf, to calculating the, the traje trajectory of astronaut Alan Glenn's 1961 Mercury flight into space. She became a summa cum laude mathematic graduate from West Virginia University at the age of 18. She was among the early group of women hired by NASA to become known as one of the group of computers in skirts. Her excellence, her excellence was known and noted early, and she was asked by, as has been indicated, astronaut John Clinton to double check that electronic computer calculation to be sure that their orbital numbers are correct. She's a wife, a mother, and a good friend to many. On November the 4th, 2015, she was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Barack, President Barack Obama, as you were seen. Most recently, Hampton acknowledged this great Hamptonian that is in our midst by conveying upon her the highest honor that we can give the Distinguished Citizens Medal for her extraordinary service to Hampton and to America. So to you, Mrs. Johnson, thank you for what you have done for all of us. And may the rich rewards and good blessings continue to be yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Wallace. Uh, in case you didn't know it, 20th Century Fox is currently shooting a major motion picture, Hidden Figures, which is scheduled to be released later this year. The film is based upon the book written by today's keynote speaker, Margot Shetterly. Uh, I'd like to share with you a video message from some of the movie's cast. Hello, hello, hello. I just wanted to personally congratulate a hero of mine, Miss Katherine Johnson. Thank you so much for opening up so many doors for young African-American women like myself and so many others who use their intelligence as their power to persevere through all obstacles that may be thrown their way. I love you so much and I'm so honored to even tell you thank you. God bless you, Miss Catherine. You are a true icon. You are a leader, and the world will forever be better because of you. God bless. Mrs. Catherine Johnson, I am happy that you are being finally being acknowledged for your contributions to history, to the world, to the space program, to women of color, to our history. And May your name long live on that building at Langley. I appreciate you and congratulations. Hi, I'm Taraji B. Henson and I want to congratulate you, Ms. Katherine Goebel Johnson, Ms. Queen Johnson, the brilliant mind, Ms. Johnson, for the naming of the building. Rightfully deserved, you deserve it. They should name Nass Nassau after you. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Uh, that was a pretty great, that was a great message, and uh, <laughs> we'll have to work on that last part. <laughs> so, so uh, Charlie Boland did want to be here today, but a scheduling conflict has kept him away, and I have a note I want to read, so he's the person that can maybe start to get that done. <laughs> uh, Dear Miss Johnson, I'm writing to offer my profound congratulations to you on being chosen to be the namesake for Langley's newest building. Along with my gratitude for the trial you have blazed, the trail you have blazed for NASA, the mathematicians, for women, for space scientists, for Afri African Americans, and for dreamers everywhere. 
I am told you once remarked that even though you grew up in the height of segregation, you did not have time to think about your place in history and that you never had a feeling of inferiority. Instead, you considered yourself, as you described it, as good as anybody else, but no better. The truth of the matter is that you are better. You are one of the greatest minds ever to grace our agency, our country, and because of your mind, heart, and soul, my own granddaughters and young Amer Americans like them can pursue their own dreams without a feeling of inferiority. Therefore, I hope today that all of us will take a step back and reflect on your impact. You have already forever left your mark on the Langley Research Center and on NASA. Now this mark will be formally inscribed on Langley's campus in the form of the Katherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility. With great awe and appreciation, Charlie F. Bolden, Administrator. So joining us today is U.S. Congressman Scott Ridgell's District Director from the 2nd District, Shannon Kendrick. She has something special for you today, Kath. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to be here before you today for this most auspicious occasion. Um, this is my third and just um, almost two months event where you are receiving your due honor and it's wonderful to personally be here to witness it. Um, I'd have to say that I'm appreciative that you charted a course and you blazed a trail for us all and we thank you for pioneering a way for so many and because of you there is a limit beyond the sky and we could all reach the stars. I am here to share a letter from Congressman Ridgell to you all, and it begins, Dear guest, I am honored and welcome. I, honor, I am honored to welcome you all to the official dedication of NASA Langley Research Center's new Katherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility. This is a deserving tribute to honor Katherine's many accomplishments and contributions to our nation's space program. Catherine began her incredible career here in Virginia's second congressional district at National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, Langley. She accomplished so much during her tenure at NACA and later NASA, including calculating the flight of Apollo 11 and Alan Shepard's 1961 Mercury flight, the first flight of an American hero into space. Catherine made tremendous contributions to our nation's space program. It is right that NASA Langley's newest building is Catherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility. My wife, Terry, joins me in welcoming you all to this event. We are grateful that so many of you have taken the opportunity to attend and share your support. Mindful that I work for you, I remain yours in freedom, Congressman Scott Ridgell. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Our next uh, speaker, and please thank Congressman Ridgell for us. Our next speaker is the Honorable Congressman Bobby Scott, a longtime friend of our center. Now in his 12th term, Congressman Scott serves as a ranking member on the Committee on Education and Workforce, where he leads the fight for access to quality early secondary and higher education for all of America's children. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Bobby Scott. Thank you, Mr. Turner, for your very kind introduction. And I'm certainly honored to be here with the elected officials and other distinguished guests, including uh, my longtime friend, Jim Johnson. It's good to see you, Jim. Um, and uh, as we're here today to celebrate the 55th anniversary of uh, Alan Shepard becoming the first American in space, as we celebrate the accomplishments of Dr. Johnson and dedicate the Catherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility so that all of her accomplishments will be recognized not only by those who knew her, but those who are able to tell her story, but we're, so that we'll be able to tell her story and inspire others. 
Dr. Johnson has had a storied career at NASA, working on every manned spaceflight uh, project from Mercury through the Apollo, uh, through um, a sp space shuttle, and even uh, the manned mission to Mars. Uh, these, <clears throat> those who are gathered here today are obviously aware of her accomplishments and her numerous awards, including three NASA Special Achievement Awards, the NASA Apollo Team Group Achievement Award, and of course, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But while she has had a long and illustrious career here at NASA, uh, she has also had an equally important impact on our community. Uh, we see uh, she's a trustee and elder at uh, Carver Memorial Presbyterian Church. She's a leader in the National Technical Association. And you can see by the pink and green in the audience that she's also been president of Lambda Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. <clears throat> As many of you know, um, our keynote speaker's book, Hidden Figures, on Dr. Johnson and other African-American women's work in, at NASA, uh, chronicles the early manned space, space flight uh, missions and the comput computations that they made to make that possible. And we look forward to that, uh, that, that movie. Uh, to be honest, I enjoy uh, comedies and thrillers just like everybody else. But frankly, Dr. Johnson's story is one that we ought to be telling our children. Uh, now, she, she uh, broke down numerous barriers throughout her career, and while she personally did not reach the stars like the astronauts whose trajectories she calculated, her career came mighty close to those stars. And I can have uh, heard that you can judge a society based on those it remembers. And I'm proud to be here today to make sure that her contributions are not forgotten. Both NASA and the Hampton Roads community have fortunate to call Dr. Johnson one of our own, and I speak for, I'm sure I speak for everybody here to say that we're all proud today to honor her and pay tributes to her accomplishments and her contributions to NASA over the years. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, and congratulations. Thank you, Congressman Scott. Uh, U.S. Senator Tim Kaine, a former governor of Virginia, couldn't be with us here today, but he wanted to send along this congratulatory video message. Hi, I'm Senator Tim Kaine. Unfortunately, I can't be here in person on this special occasion, but I want to thank NASA Langley Research Center for inviting me to take part in this great event. Ms. Johnson is being recognized today because of her invaluable contributions to the nation's space program during her career as a NASA mathematician. Ms. Johnson's work helped America send a man to space and then to the moon. These advances then pushed the boundaries of exploration and paved the way for our current goal of reaching Mars. Her 33 years of service helped NASA take great strides in science and innovation that have not been forgotten in her retirement. In fact, people are still building upon the foundation that her work laid. But as many have said before me, including President Obama during his presentation of the Medal of Freedom last year, Ms. Johnson's impacts on our nation stretch well beyond her stellar mathematical calculations. Just as her work challenged the limits of our reach beyond Earth, her character challenged our way of thinking about women in the fields of science, mathematics, and engineering. As a pioneer for women and people of color wishing to break into new technical fields, Ms. Johnson has set a proud example for people to follow their dreams, no matter the norms and conventions, and to reach for the stars in their own lives. Ms. Johnson may not have flown to the moon herself, but she's a living example of how to shoot for the moon. Catherine, the Commonwealth is proud to have your legacy at NASA Langley, and I send my best to you. Congratulations on these wonderful awards and distinctions, and to all who have uh, supported you along the way. And now our keynote speaker, Margot Shetterly who is accompanied here today by her parents, Barbara and Margaret Lee. Uh, is no stranger to NASA Langley. Her father worked as a researcher in Langley's science directorate. After growing up with a father who was an atmospheric scientist and a mother who was a professor of English at Hampton University, perhaps it should come as no surprise that Margot became somebody who could write about scientists. And we're glad that she did, and we're very pleased that her book and the movie that's based on her book 
are the shining example of a bright light of accomplishments on people like Catherine. Please join me in welcoming Margot Shetterly. Good afternoon to everyone, all of our distinguished guests. Um, it's such an exciting thing to be here. Uh, Catherine, I am so proud and I am so thrilled uh, to participate in this wonderful ceremony today. Um, you have distinguished yourself with outstanding work in mathematics and computation, so it's absolutely natural and makes all the sense in the world that this building should bear your name. Uh, five years ago, I sat down with Mrs. Johnson for the first time to interview her about her life and her career. And what's happened since then has been overwhelming, to say the least. Her story and the story of the other women who served our country as mathematicians has captivated America. Uh, but there was a reason why I named the book Hidden Figures. Their stories until this point had really gone unrecognized and untold. And I'm very proud to have played a role in bringing their stories to the public where it, they deserve to be. So uh, I won't make very long remarks today, but I wanted to do uh, is we've heard a lot of words from uh, or about Mrs. Johnson. What I wanted to do today is to use her words to talk a little bit about her career, her work, and some of the other women that I've learned about through her, because most brilliant people have respect for other brilliant people, and that's one of the things that I've learned from her. So um, I, I am looking forward to sharing many of the words that she has shared with me over the five years that I've gotten to know about her and her story. Um, as you know, uh, she started out in the West Computing Facility, as we've, we've talked about here earlier today, the guests have mentioned. This was a segregated facility originally, uh, but two weeks after that, she was sent to the Flight Research Division here in NASA Langley. And any time I've asked her about the people that she worked with, the first thing she says is they were brainy folks, and she just loved those brainy people. Of course, the names changed over time, and uh, one of the things that I think it's really important for us to remember is though Mrs. Johnson is known for her work on the space program, she spent four years working on airplane security and airplane regulations and trying to make airplanes safer. So the next time you get on an airplane, you should also think of her and think of the people here at NASA Langley because the air safety that we have today is due in large part to their work as well. So one of the things that people ask me constantly about this book and about the movie is, why haven't I heard this story before? Well, I think one of the reasons why we haven't heard it, it's because of the modesty of Mrs. Johnson and these women who were just doing their job. And I think many of us who have had conversations with her, we ask, how did it feel to be such an important part of history? How, what, what did you do to deal with the pressure of calculating these, these very important calculations. The astronaut's safety depended on it. And she very modestly says, I was just doing my job. Well, what I wanted to do today is to show you a little bit about what that job actually entailed. So as you can see here um, on the left, September 1960, this is the research report that detailed the orbital equations that the, uh, the group that she was in, the aerospace mechanics group, used to put a man into orbit. And you can see some of the pages there from the presentation. Now, imagine, if you can see these eight pages, imagine something that is 150 pages of that. And you have to check it using this machine on the left. This is the work that she was asked to do in the countdown to the flight in which John Glenn took a huge step and was the first American to orbit the Earth. Uh, that's pressure. <laughs> um, but Mrs. Johnson stood up to that pressure. Her numbers were right. And they used her numbers to help calibrate and check the computers, which were new at that time. Now, a, an electronic computer, you can't look in, an eye, in the eye, but a human computer, you can. You can ask questions, and that's one of the reasons why they asked this brilliant woman to make sure that everything was in order before John Glenn took off for the heavens. 
It wasn't very long into my conversations with Mrs. Johnson before I heard the name Dorothy Vaughn. Now, this is someone that she said over and over again, Dorothy Vaughn. And I asked myself, well, I asked her, who is Dorothy Vaughn? And she said, well, Dorothy Vaughn was my initial supervisor. When she was sent originally to the West Computing Office, she worked, and it was just for two weeks, but she worked for Mrs. Dorothy Vaughn. Now, Dorothy Vaughn came here to Hampton Roads during World War II. She was a math teacher at Robert Moton High School, um, which gained a measure of fame also for its role in leading up to the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision, Supreme Court decision. Um, but Mrs. Vaughn was the head of this group called the West Computers. And uh, Mrs. Johnson has told me many times about the respect that she had for Mrs. Vaughn and for her talent. And what she said over and over is, Dot Vaughn was the smartest of all the girls. So here's an example here of Mrs. Vaughn's work. So as a supervisor, uh, and she was promoted in 1951 to the head of the West Area Comp Computing Group. And per my research, I believe that makes her the first African-American supervisor in the history of NASA. Now this is in 1951, which I think is very impressive. Um, and here's an example of Mrs. Vaughn's work. She was drafted to help consult on a handbook using algebraic methods on the Frieden and the, uh, the Monroe calculating machines, uh, which, is, which is a pretty important thing if you consider that those machines formed the basis of all of the aeronautical research and later the space research that was done here at this facility. Before Dorothy Vaughn took the helm at the West Computers, a woman named Marjorie Hanna was the head of the group. Now, Marjorie was in the East Computing Group, and this was the group of the white women at the center, and she was appointed to head this group. Um, Marjorie was somebody who took this assignment very seriously. She treated the women in her, her group as equals, and this is something that we take for granted now. Um, she actually socialized with the women in her group. She invited them to her homes, and uh, we take this for granted, but this was a very big deal back in those days. Now, Marjorie Hanna was also a very good mathematician. In 1948, she co-authored a report with Sam Katzoff, which is, and I'm sure many people here at the center know and remember his name. Uh, he went on, went on to become the chief scientist here at NASA Langley. And back in 1948, Marjorie Hanna was moved to the full-scale tunnel, and she and Sam Katzoff co-authored a report um, she then went on to uh, co-author another report. She was moved over, over to Mrs. Johnson's division, and she co-authored another report with an engineer there on something called the Grand Tour of the Outer Planets. And this was the idea that a spaceship would leave the Earth and then basically planet hop from Mars onto Saturn to Jupiter using the gravity of each planet to slingshot it ahead to the next planet. Um, she received an award for this in 1970, but when I mentioned her name to Mrs. Johnson, she said that she thought that Marjorie Hanna was somebody who hadn't received the credit that she deserved. So what I wanted to do today is to mention her name to you so that you guys know what work she did. Now, here's somebody whose name and face I think is very familiar to us. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Christine Darden, she wasn't able to be here today. She's in Colorado visiting her grandchildren. Um, she started out in 1967 at the center, and this was at the very end of the computing pool. Uh, and Dr. Darden started as a, what was called at the time a data analyst, um, which is sort of the, the name for the work that the women did. It changed over time. It was computer, sometimes it was mathematician math aides, there are different words and different names for that work over time. Uh, but what Dr. Darden really wanted to do was to be an engineer and to do her own research. So after a couple of years in the computing pool, uh, she went to her division chief. And I think those of you who are here at NASA uh, and who understand the hierarchy can just imagine the idea of somebody who's a data analyst who's been here for four years going to the division chief, who is a, a pretty important person. And what she said was, I don't understand why is it that women who come in here are hired as data analysts, whereas men are hired as engineers. 
what I want to do is I want to do my own research. I want the same privileges that the men have. And uh, why is this? So um, the division chief didn't really have a good answer to that. <laughs> but two weeks later, he made the transfer, and Dr. Darden was able to continue her own research, start her own research. And on the left, you'll see uh, the cover from her pioneering report in 1975. Um, and so what she did, and this was a time when computers really were coming into use here in, in not just space, but also in aeronautical research. She modeled the sonic boom. And so the sonic boom is the crack that we hear, like thunderclap, uh, when a vehicle supersedes the speed of sound. So her work in modeling sonic boom is still the basis for industry standard sonic boom software that's still used in the industry today. And um, she is somebody when, you know, there are many times when I talked to Mrs. Johnson and I'd ask her about her work and she said, no, I want to talk about Christine Darden. <laughs> and uh, she said to me, and you know that Mrs. Johnson goes into schools, she's, she's extremely energetic about getting students interested in STEM careers. And she said, I mention Christine Darden every chance I get because she is a model of how far mathematical talent can take you. Now, of all the words that I've heard Mrs. Johnson say, and at this point, there are many, and there, there's so many interesting things I've learned about her and from her, but I think the one that stays with me the most is this, and we heard it mentioned here a little bit earlier, you are no better than anyone else, and no one is better than you. Now, I think it's really tempting for us to focus on the part of no one is better than you. But I think the real subtlety and the meat and the power of this statement is the part that says you are no better than anyone else. And really, this is one of the reasons why Mrs. Johnson's story has captivated us. She has such a towering talent but she has gone out of her way to recognize talent in other people, regardless of their gender, of their race, of their background. If you're a smart person, then you know she wants to have a conversation with you and she sees you as an equal. And that is something, it's a great lesson that I have learned. So Catherine, thank you so much for everything that you've given us, for what you've given me. Thank you for your career, for shining a light on the talents of other people and congratulations for this well-deserved honor. Thank you, Margot. So uh, I'm gonna do what I classically do and go off script a little bit here. So you've heard us mention uh, Alan Shepard's flight and John Glenn's flight, and you've heard us mention it several times. That's not because we didn't have enough material to add here. That's because of how impressed we are. Those of us that do this and have those 40,000 foot facilities with large computers and computational tools, we are completely blown away and awed by what you did and your colleagues did. So we'd like to thank you again for that. So at this time, I'd like to call forward Mel Farabee, the director, and Mel Farabee and the director of our Center Operations Directorate, Loretta Kellerman, for the official unveiling of the plaque that commemorates the naming of the Catherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility. Catherine, and I'll read the citation from the plaque. Catherine Johnson was hired as a research mathematician at Langley when it was a laboratory of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the agency that preceded NASA. Her incomparable mathematical skills influenced every major space program from Mercury through Space Shuttle. She is known especially for the calculations of the 1961 trajectory for Alan Shepard's Mercury spacecraft flight, the first American in space, the verification of John Glenn's 1962 Mercury space, spacecraft flight, the first flight calculation made by an electronic computer, and the 1969 Apollo 11 flight to the moon. During a ceremony at the White House in 2015, President Barack Obama personally awarded her the Presidential Freedom Medal, our nation's highest civilian honor. 
Catherine, on behalf of NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden, all the employees here at NASA Langley, and all NASA employees, past, present, and future, I would like to present you with this replica of the plaque. Okay, uh, Catherine, this plaque will be permanently mounted in the building's lobby as a reminder of your amazing contributions. And before uh, we continue, I'd like to invite the regional director for the sorority. Uh, I think there was an announcement. Yes, please come on up. Thank you. On behalf of the Board of Directors, led by Dr. Dorothy Buchanan Wilson and the 300,000 ladies of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, it is my honor to present these roses to our sorority member, Dr. Katherine Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, before we conclude today's ceremony, there is one last piece of official business we have to take care of. Catherine played a pivotal role in the success of our nation's human spaceflight program. Some of the key humans involved in that program are the astronauts themselves. Perhaps more so than anyone else, it's our NASA astronauts who have an immense appreciation for what it takes to get them into space and safely home again which might be why the NASA Astronaut Corps created a special award to recognize those who help them do the amazing things that they do, the Space Flight Awareness Silver Snoopy Award. At this time, I'd like to introduce retired astronaut and former NASA Langley employee, Leland Melvin. Leland began working here in 1989, and in 1998, he was selected into the NASA Astronaut Corps and went on two space flights. STS-122 in 2008 and STS-129 in 2009, logging more than 565 hours in space. In October 2010, Leland was named Associate Administrator for NASA's Office of Education. He retired from NASA in February 2014. Please join me in welcoming Leland to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a very, uh, very beautiful day. Hey, Catherine. 
Um, I'm so honored to be here with friends and family and community. This uh, NASA Langley was my first job out of graduate school, and one of the people that had retired, she retired in 1986, I came on in 1989, but it wasn't like she was retired because I saw her all the time at NTA conventions, at, at doing math contests, inspiring young girls and young boys to be great mathematicians and SAT tutorials and all of these things. So she helped mold my career and mentored me at a very young age as a professional here at NASA Langley. So I'm just very honored and proud to have on, on National Astronaut Day <laughs> being the recipient of the work that she did to get me to space safely. And I say that Catherine has been, I call this a shiro of mine for a very long time. And her dedication, her excellence to professionalism and social barriers that she broke, and for her ongoing commitment to inspiring future explorers like myself. Astronaut Jeanette Epps will be the first African-American female to fly from Kazakhstan to the International Space Station for a six-month tour. So the legacy that Katherine Johnson has given us will help the first African-American woman be on the International Space Station in a few years. And that's a testament to her work. As, Turner, as uh, Clayton Turner mentioned, the Silver Snoopy is a special NASA award given for professional excellence and vital contributions to the human spaceflight program. It is always given by a member of the astronaut corps. By the way, we have another member possibly in the audience from NASA Langley, Dr. Charlie Camarda. Is Charlie here? Yeah, one more time. He was supposed to be here, but he wasn't on time. <laughs> But uh, Charlie got into the astronaut corps and then inspired me to join soon after that. So uh, I wanted to give a little props out to him, another Langley guy. Those of us comprising NASA flight crews, especially the early heroes of space flight, Shepard, Glenn, crews of Apollo 11, and the maiden voyage of Space Shuttle Columbia, recognize that the success of each mission is measured by the dedication to excellence and teamwork of such people like Catherine. Her efforts demonstrated that she was a vital link in the success of our space programs, and we thank you for many contributions. Catherine played a key role in this effort since the earliest days of astronaut travel until her retirement from NASA Langley. Catherine, it is my pleasure to present this sterling silver Snoopy to you in appreciation for ex your exceptional service in calculating trajectories and orbits of America's pioneering space flights. You demonstrated the technical competence, dedication, and pride that guarantee mission success. This silver Snoopy pin was flown aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis in 2009 during my second mission, STS-129. I'm honored to bestow this recognition as such, on such a worthy recipient and dear friend, Dr. Catherine G. Johnson. Testing one, two. I just want to say that a couple of months ago, I gave Catherine my flown pin because she had not been given a pin yet. So now we're going to swap pins <laughs> with the silver Snoopy that I'm going to give you right now.
This is a letter of appreciation for professionalism, dedication, and outstanding support that greatly enhanced spaceflight safety and mission success. In recognition of these achievements, and as a symbol of our special thanks, the astronaut team presents Astronauts Personal Achievement Award to Katherine G. Johnson, May 5th, 2016, on Astronaut Day. words from a friend, but it is my pleasure to receive the gift you have given me, the prize that you were given me. I've enjoyed receiving them. <laughs> and cat, the toilet tells me they're going to put on a room to put them in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do thank you so much for your attention, for your kindness. But more than that, I, I'm so happy to see them now giving more recognition to women for the work that they have done when they pulled out a few notes to write down what I had worked on. The guy had 20 pages. <laughs> At the time, it was just another day's work. I have always done my best, and I asked the young ladies here who are interested in majoring in math, that's what you like about math. It gives you a right and a wrong. You, see, you can write the best theme in the world, but who's going to say who wrote it, you know? But if you've done an answer to a problem that somebody else has worked on, yours is the answer yes. that is important. So I thank you for recognizing that women have long been doing a lot of the work. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> the men got credit for it. And you can just look at me and say that she did her share. And you do your share, do your best at all times. Do it because you like it. I like work. I like learning. As a little seven-year-old boy, his father is here. Who is going to teach me Spanish? Because I spoke French. He said, we all speak Spanish. And we all, at our house, we all speak Spanish. So every time he comes to see me, which is necessarily often now that I have moved, but he comes and gives me a Spanish lesson. Knowing that I like learning. So I ask you to enjoy learning, want to learn, and you will do it. And you will use every bit of it at some time. Who would have thought that 50 years ago when he asked me to, how far were we from the moon on a certain date, I could just open a notebook and tell him. You could do it easily enough all the time. Somebody wants to know something. Help them. Help anybody you can help. You never know whom you are helping, but they will appreciate it, and so will you later. But thanks again for everything you, you've given me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Next year, we celebrate our centennial, the first NASA center to do so. For almost 100 years, it has been people like Catherine, their curiosity, passion, and brilliance that have helped to solve some of the most challenging, some of the most difficult challenges of our time. We take immense pride in the work of those who came before us, and we celebrate our story past by honoring them and their accomplishments. We're also incredibly excited about our soaring future. The Katherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility will help carry this center, its people, and the awe-inspiring work that we do into the next century. Katherine, thank you is not enough, but that's what we have. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our ceremony. We'd like to invite you to join us for a reception afterwards. Uh, we have uh, cake and punch in the background. Or, excuse me, cake and lemonade, I'm told. It's Southern, it's not us being cheap. <laughs> but thank you all for coming. Thank you.